Welcome to Life on Maui. I'm your host, Stephen Freed. Very happy to be back on Maui after another long stint in Southeast Asia. Our guest for today is a woman who has been a, uh, a, a tremendous influence in my life these last two, two and a half years. Uh, she is uh, someone that I would call an awake soul. Any time that I've interacted with her in person or on the phone from all over the world, nothing changes as far as her being present in the moment, available with humor, and uh, it's just been an amazing process of uh, gradually more and more through my interactions with her coming more into myself. I've had a, uh, uh, a spiritual teacher, a teacher for many, many years of my life, uh, Prem Rawat, who has been a tremendous influence in my life. But this one-on-one -on -one with Polly these last couple of years has um, lent a personalness that I didn't have before to the whole process of awakening, which as I see more and more, it's actually just a very simple thing of dropping into who I am. So with that, and after, again, many, many conversations around the world with Polly, I am so happy to have her in the studio with us today and uh, Polly, I love you, and I'm so happy you're here. Thank you, Steve. It's really wonderful getting to do this again, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're doing, we're doing yes. it again. We're coming back for a, a, a second stint because in the last couple of years, uh, lots happened even in the way that you teach. Exactly. And mm -hmm. well, why don't we start off there? From the time that you um, started with me, until now, or the time we did our last interview, what would you say are some of the subtle changes or subtle ways that you feel like things have become more clarified? Well, very, they have. They, they have changed a lot, but it's more like a, a higher level of integration of all the different perspectives that I brought, and it's a, an embodiment and a um, abiding in my own awake state so that I began to see what was needed for the people that I work with, uh, the way in which the dismantling of the fear-based self-concept does exactly what you said. Mm. It's like when that's gone, I am mm. awake mm. in this very simple and natural way. It is our natural way of being, mm. uh, but the embroilment with the fear-based self-concept, which is what we've identified with mm -hmm. since pre-verbally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so it's, it's a, a much more integrated approach. I feel like I'm capable of being much more helpful to people in their own process. And it's, it's really wonderful for me. And I appreciate everybody that I work with so much. Well, that's mm -hmm. one of the amazing things. Uh, uh, I, I use the word amazing a lot. I'll try and use different words. One of the fabulous things <laughs> about working uh, with you, which isn't working at all, it's, um, it's very playful. Um, I love our time together. I, it, and, and it doesn't matter to me if it's uh, on the phone or if it's in person. They're both exactly the same for me. Yes. I can be sitting in uh, Chiang Mai, Thailand <laughs> on, on little phone and you, and I just feel like it's, it, it, I feel like you're right with me inside of me. Yeah. And um, this has been uh, what I really feel is that uh, you have a, uh, 
a, a wonderful ability to be able to, um, what I'll say is really get inside of a person and be able to, I think in your own words, be able to find words to describe what it is that somebody is feeling or experiencing in their life. And sometimes there's just a tremendous relief mm -hmm. in having, you know, something that seems complicated. And you can run it by and it's like you have a way of taking something and reflecting it back in words that brings a tremendous sense of relief to my spirit and my soul. And mm -hmm. it just feels accurate. It's like there is a time when it's just like, oh, I just feel this great relaxation and relief because mm. something has been said that feels so accurate and so clear inside of me uh, that you've expressed. So how does how is that on your end? I mean, right. what's going on on your end that you're able to do that? That's a, that's a really good question because even mm -hmm. though I do it all the time, I feel like I use uh, the mind to undo the mind. But the process with a person, in like your experience with what I do, for me, it's it's like I don't think that anything's wrong, and I think there's light. I have I have a perspective to to put light on what you're expressing that you're suffering with, and then together it occurs in me the clearest way to look at it. So there's a way in which, because, you know, I've said many times, uh, if I ever wrote a book, which I won't, that the title of it would be, What If Nothing's Wrong? Mm -hmm. And so from the perspective of that, which is always in me, so I am the space in which that's true, and then together we are with what you think is wrong. And it's not that I minimize or diminish the idea that I'm suffering. The suffering's real, right? But the minute that we together put light on it, it just, it changes, yeah, it changes. It absolutely does, it yeah. shifts. And uh, I think that that's one of the uh, uh, amazing, uh, one of the <laughs> wonderful, I'm gonna keep away from that word, one of the wonderful things that you keep reminding is that one of a polyism is it would never occur to you that things should be anything should be any different than it is. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> one of the things that causes the most suffering is the fact that when we want something to be different than it is in the moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really one of the, if, if I was going to pick a kind of a single thing that feels very uh, enlightening within myself is when I uh, come across something that feels like I wish it would be different. Yeah. And within myself, it's like, well, this is what is at this moment. Just be with this. And... But there's also another thing that you say, and, and I want to uh, bring uh, highlight this as well, is, uh, is you say, you don't like to put sugar over shit. Right. <laughs> so th this is a no bullshit gal, and not only that, totally um, down to earth, body. I mean, we've had some of the greatest kind of sexual, I mean, th there's no pristineness or uh, um, <laughs> fluffiness about this. It's really down to earth yeah. you are. And it's one of the things I absolutely love is just the kind of the robustness of life, you know, that it's, it permeates all the corners of our interactions. It can go into all of those spaces. It's not, it's not like I feel like there's something I need to avoid because it's <laughs> rude talking to you. Never! As a matter of fact, it's great. And that laugh, just <laughs> that laugh just breaks through all kinds of layers. So talk a little bit about um, that aspect of it, not putting sugar over shit, and how you might interact with someone 
hear what they have to say and also um, not do that and yet bring light to it at the same time. Right. Well, the uh, model that I use uh, first, I, the caveat is that language is always at least too removed from the reality of what it expresses, right? So we're always using language only to point to. But the model that I use is the metaphysics of the Course in Miracles. And the quick and dirty on that is that we're caught in a bad dream of separation and that uh, in that bad dream of separation, what we do is that we have a sense of who we are that's fear-based. Because what permeates the dream of separation, which is depicted in all the, like the garden story in Western theology, uh, is fear because we've been cut off from God, or from all that is. We're l left alone, and we have to make it on our own. And that bad dream, because it's not true, from that bad dream, we construe a self-concept. And pre-verbally, we, we, in this sense of I am just this body, and we feel the, the separateness from all that is, our idea is that we're in jeopardy, we're, we're at risk. And we may even have a self-concept that begins with, I'm not enough, or I'm, I'm not going to make it, or I don't deserve to live, or I'm in the way. And then we have caretakers, again, because we're caught in a bad dream, who reflect back to us that this is a risky world, that this is scary. And so from that, we have an idea of who we are. We have an idea about the nature of the reality that we're caught in, and we begin to uh, formulate ways, adaptive behaviors and strategies to deal with this. And what I mean by this is the lie that we're separate. That creates a self-concept. And I just wanted to give this little bit of theory because everything hangs on that. We continue to live our lives as if we are left, if we've been abandoned by God, by all that is, and that we are um, less than, that we're not enough, and that we have to figure out a way to interact with this external world. Now, the interesting thing, as in a nighttime dream, the interesting thing about this dream is that it's a projection through our fear-based mind of separation. And so what we're interacting with as an external world is the projection. Just as in a nighttime dream, it's projected through our mind, there are no, there's not a cast of characters in the bedroom with us playing the part of the monster and the good girl and the this and that. Just to, That's what's true about this experience in what we call the real world. That's why I call the work I'm doing now becoming lucid in the dream. The very first step is to become aware that this is a dream, that it's my projection and that I have to reclaim my attention. This is a part of the work we're doing. And I've talked so long now, I don't remember your question. <laughs> no, you it perfectly answered it, and it leads to the next question, actually, which is, it's not a question, but it's a clarification, that one of the things that you uh, often say is, there is no out there out there. Right, right. <laughs> there is no out there out there. And that's another one of the things, along with the one I mentioned before, that keeps recurring to me that there is no out there out there, right. that uh, whatever it is that's showing up in my world and our world is a reflection of what's going on inside, that we're, we're in a movie and that uh, we're the uh, producer and director and we choose the cast of characters and that whatever it is that's showing up in our world is just to highlight back to us uh, what it is that we need to see, or or yeah. something like that. Something, it's it, it's 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 a manifestation of what's going on within, and any real change that we want to see, it's not going to happen by manipulating outside. So talk talk about that. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're a good student, Steve. <laughs> Thank you. You've internalized a lot of what we've done over the last uh, two or three years. Yeah, the, because it is a projection. 
and we're caught in the idea that that's the real world, then we have all of our attention out there, right? Uh, one of the metaphors I use is that when you look in the mirror and your hair's a mess, you don't clean the mirror. And that's what you were saying. Mm -hmm. You don't try to adjust the movie so that it'll be all right. You come back into the space within you that, is, uh, that has the same uh, feeling as what you're experiencing in the outer world that you would prefer not to experience, right? Well, the information that we're receiving as, a, as another, uh, you know, I always put things in like little little blip so we can get it yes. and, and this this piece is that fundamentally what's being projected is who you're being to yourself uh -huh. so it's in what we can see out there is what is the self relationship so if we have the experience of being disrespected or if we have this experience of being neglected or not being loved then we find in us and, and this, is a, this is a model to use that's very practical. I don't um, presume that this is the truth of it. I don't think that we would know what that would be. But this is a model that's a working model for how to reclaim the attention that you've projected out there, back here. Fundamentally, we have, <coughs> we have um, the witness self available to us. Um, and we have our attention. And those, between those two things, we have the experience of our world. Mm -hmm. All of our attention has been projected out, and it's been through a distorted lens of fear. So what that movie is looking like, now there's another piece to this, because it's left brain, because... The left brain is... The left brain, the rational analytic, mm -hmm. all of that is what we came upon when we had the experience in the story, mm -hmm. the garden story, of being kicked out of the garden, we, the admonition was don't eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. That's the polarity. Now, so what's at work in this fear-based self-concept is the left brain that has everything projected as a polarity. So you may have the good end of the stick, but the other end's gonna come. It's good and evil. Mm -hmm. It's wealth and poverty. Uh -huh. So everything, in this projection, there isn't anything that doesn't have an other end to the stick. Right. And like we all know the, the paraphrase of the quote from Einstein, there's no solution for the problem at the level the problem was created. Mm -hmm. It's the same, that frequency, you've got to go meta to that. Mm -hmm. but, but, but both ends of the stick carry the same frequency. And so we keep adjusting, as you were saying, we keep trying to make it better. What occurs to me now is that all of the human potential movement, all of the secret, all of the idea of my intention and working has to do with the dream reality. And uh, it's like trying to make a fear-based idea of myself at least better. Mm. And, and there's, you know, there's a certain level of improvement that we can get to. Mm -hmm. One of the things we realize is that there's like the uh, things get better. I'm, I'm cleaned up, you know, in terms of addiction. Right. I'm getting really good at that. But then there's the other end of the stick that's lurking. That's and, right. and we have the experience of that. We're never quite free of the other end of that stick, right. no matter how good it gets. So everything that's projected as this external reality and our attention is caught in it, we are compromised that way. And so becoming lucid in the stream is, is to become aware that that's what's going on and then to reclaim your attention from what in fact is a projection. It's um, using the analogy of the nighttime dream, it's like when you become lucid in that dream, you know, you can turn around and say, wow, I'm going to move over this way this time because I'm dreaming and that doesn't work for me. So in this, this awake, what we call the awake dream, you're, you're, you're coming to reclaim your attention from what doesn't work for you. Right. Right. Yeah, that's, that's another thing I wanted to say. Another thing that maybe being a good student <laughs> or a good listener <laughs> is the thing that I've become more aware of is not to be... I almost don't want to put it in, in the negative, not to be, but becoming aware of 
like you said, both ends of the stick. Mm -hmm. And being aware that, um, and, and I want to clarify this right here with you, but uh, being aware of both ends of the stick of um, how if, you know, I'm getting uh, uh, elated about something, mm -hmm. then there's the other end of the stick that I'm afraid of losing it. Exactly. And then conversely, the other side of right. the coin, you know, be, you know, being on the down end and feeling like, oh my God, I'll, I'll never be happy again. Right. Okay, so I'm just coming from a place, Thailand, where it's the Buddhist culture and their very middle path, and my girlfriend, Nalini, over there um, in, embodies that. You know, not, don't, don't want it to be too good or, or too bad. Let's just hang out in the middle. Right. But there's, there's another level of this that I feel like it's, that's a, almost a calculation that they do over there. Of like it, it, it almost feels, what is it, left brain? Uh, it mm -hmm. almost feels like mm -hmm. a decision right. that they make over there in Thailand, a decision to be in the middle. But there's another place of experience that I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm mm -hmm. starting to become, uh, that I'm becoming aware of that it doesn't have anything to do with a decision, it has to do with an experience. It has to do with right. who we are. Exactly. And you were just alluding to that to do with the, the one who's watching. Right. So elaborate on that some, because I think that's really a, a big part of this. Well, it's, it's the fundamental part. I always say the good news is that when everything that's not real and we've made up out of our fear-based projected dream um, all of the suffering. We've made up all of the I'm not good enough. All, everything is made up in that way and, it's, and, it, and because the projection r creates the experience of that, it's very compelling. Mm -hmm. We don't doubt that I think I used uh, the analogy, I mean, you know, I can say it, well, that's what you believe, and they and my students say, "Believe it, hell! I can prove it. My whole life has been like that, you know." And of course, it has, because that's the distorted lens through which the projection shows up. The really good news. This is I always feel like this is the the you know, Jesus said uh, the gospel, the the good news was the kingdom of heaven is within, and and that's that's a way of talking about what we're talking about here. It's like when that fear-based self-concept begins to be seen through. We're becoming lucid in the dream and it starts to dismantle itself uh, because we bring our attention back. We get our attention back here. I call it creating the experience of being on my own side. Mm -hmm. I am all of my attention back here rather than out there caught up in a projection. And the ways that it's caught up is there's something I need to get or something I need to avoid. There's the polarity, right? Mm -hmm. And so we interact with this dream mm -hmm. <laughs> as if it were real and become more and more embroiled in it and, and, it's, and it's more and more convincing thereby, you see. So as we get our attention back here, now the distortion of the self-concept clears up because it's fundamentally based in the idea of unworthiness or, or insufficiency or I'm not capable of. Mm -hmm. So what we're starting to do just in the moment, be aware of what's going on that I'm caught up in and reclaim your attention from it. So that's a lot of the work that I do. Mm -hmm. with. So as mm -hmm. we do that, what happens is that the self-concept is being energetically dismantled. It depends on all of our attention being, believing in it or being caught by it. Mm -hmm. So it's starting to just become dismantled. Mm -hmm. And this is in, in the uh, preface in The Course in Miracles, it says, what is real cannot be threatened. Mm -hmm. What is unreal does not exist. Therein lies the peace of God. Mm -hmm. And what is unreal is this fear-based self-concept. It's unreal but we've been believing it. We've created an entire world collectively based on it, and we see what's happening there. It's all suffering because the frequency of it is a lie. Mm -hmm. So it's very exciting when we start to come back here. It has this feeling of reclaiming your attention 
and then looking out at a world in which you're in an entirely different relationship with, right? Now, the truth, when we ask the question, if the Advaita question is, who am I, right? I am the space, I am awareness, I am, I am presence. I am the space in which it all arises, including the bad dream, but now my attention is back here. And so there's nothing to do to create this. It is what is. It's the truth of who we are, many different expressions of it. But when this goes, this is what's true. And that's being awake, and it's the most natural way to be, because this has been the unnatural aberration which is, you know, whatever, whatever we think about time being linear sequential, is it's either had a whole lot of holograms involved in it or it's been thousands of years of believing in the lie that we are separate from God. Well, that's one of the things that I feel that is uh, really uh, is starting to integrate in me is, um, is the thing you were just saying about it being the most natural thing. Exactly. Uh, and then you use the word dismantling. And it, it really does feel like it, it's, it's falling away. Right. It's falling away because uh, I'm not putting my attention on it. It's, exactly. You know, I'm, not put it, that I'm putting my attention elsewhere on whatever you want to call it, uh, life. Right. And um, one of the things you've said uh, recently, and it, it just feels so lovely, is that it's really um, quite, um, I don't know that you use this word exactly, there was another word, but it's something like you use the word like quite mundane. It's not it's exactly. It's ordinary. It's ordinary. Yeah, it's ordinary. And, and what a wonderful thing. Exactly. It's just ordinary, and I'm beginning to really come into this place that you know, so much, so many books, so many teachers, so many things can make it seem like it's extraordinary, right. and it's actually ordinary, and that's the beauty of it: is that it's ordinary, and in that ordinariness, if that's a word, there it, it just life is so beautiful. Yes, yeah. I, I sometimes say that the most um, profound experience of being awake is relaxation. Mm -hmm. The mind relaxes because it's no longer caught in fear, mm -hmm. and we fall into our hearts, which is the truth of who we are, and from there, you know, I always say we, we fall in love and stay there, and it's absolutely ordinary, but in this, this most remarkable way that we've never experienced. Much of what's going on in collective consciousness uh, partakes of this. There are people who wake up who are not, haven't been on a spiritual path. All of a sudden, it just, they just see through the lie, and they're no longer caught in it. But th what you mentioned in, in that uh, statement is it's the, the whole thing has to do with where are you putting your attention? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I, I, if, if there's a right use of the will, it is, I am unwilling to be caught in that lie anymore, mm -hmm. in this moment. Now, that's the other caveat, which mm -hmm. always, um, you know, prevails, which is, this is it, right here, right now. Who am I being? What do I want to experience? The one thing that makes the difference in how this shows up out here and what my inner experience is, is the frequency of my inner state of being. And my commitment to being at peace, regardless of what's going on, is a very powerful technique to have your attention back here in what's not on a polarity. The, the fundamental ways of the truth of who we are are not on a polarity. It's not good and evil or black and white. It, it, it is the true nature of love. It's the true nature of connection. It's the true nature of freedom and peace, not held in a polarity, because in this space, of what we could call the heart, it is the truth of who we are, there's no polarity. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my favorite qu quotes from one of my teachers is, the mind has no answers, the heart has no questions. Mm. How, how sweet is that? How sweet, <laughs> how sweet is that? Is that? How yeah. sweet is that? And, um, you know, 
many of us uh, appreciate the, the teachings of um, Esther Hicks Abraham. Yes. And the part of what you were just talking about in this last little bit has to do with um, the uh, the interstate and how uh, how what's going on inside is creative, mm -hmm. and so much of that is. Uh, what they talk about it as far as always choose the uh, best feeling that you can feel mm -hmm. in a nutshell that mm -hmm. that's what they're saying is uh, always choose the best feeling you can feel Ch right. choose the, okay. um, uh, the the most joy the most uh, happiness the most and um, we were talking a few weeks ago and I, I thought there was a, a clarification that you made mm -hmm. in um, how you teach and that, and highlighting the fact that they're, how good their teaching is, that it really, Absolutely. it just really uh, does a wonderful things for people, but yet there is a, a, a clarification. Do you remember what we were talking about? Well, I can say some things about it. Um, I used to go see Jerry and Esther when I lived in Texas. And, um, and this was 20 years ago. Mm. And such a beautiful opening into the nature of what's going on that they brought through Abraham. Um, it goes back to what you so, you shared about my way of not putting sugar over shit. You, if it, I, I don't believe in positive thinking. Mm -hmm. So I'm not looking for anybody to effort at our or try to override what may be something that needs to come into the light. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it, it is what we don't know about ourselves that runs us. We have so subconsciously pushed down all of our ideas about ourselves out of our fear and through adaptive behaviors so that we could try to make it in this bad dream. And uh, as we do that, then that's underneath putting off a frequency and then showing up as our world. And it, it, sometimes it doesn't make any sense to us at all because this has been pushed so far down. So whatever's showing up is what we want to bring t into the light. It's like bringing the error into the light, using consciousness as a light to consider. Some of what I do I call, I think I said it before, using the mind to undo the mind. Mm. And that's fundamental to... Um, one of the trainings I had was with, with Byron Katie. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that the amazing gift that she brought into uh, <clears throat> consciousness aware, conscious awareness is the, the way in which what you're thinking determines your frequency and determines your experience. And if it doesn't feel good, you, you check in with what you're thinking because it's gonna be a lie. But there's also another aspect of that where you check in and you say, is is that true? That's right. That's a that's a Byron Katie. That's the Byron Katie. Uh, the, the her process goes through four questions and a turnaround, because but what I have my students do is to notice if they, if they're not feeling good, then the thought came prior to that experience, even though they weren't aware of it, uh -huh. and they can't access that thought, mm. you know. And when you put the light on that thought. Whatever the thought is, if it's not, if you don't feel good, if it creates a contraction or a uh, self-blame or doubt or whatever, then you know that it's not true, but you start to inquire. And this is using the mind to inquire. And in the question, is it true? Can I prove that it's true? One of the things that usually comes up, well, sometimes it's true and sometimes it's not. So on the face of it, I'm, I'm believing something that is not true. It goes, it comes. That's the nature, uh, you know, one of the metaphors that they use in consciousness work is, I am sky and here, is, here are the clouds going by. Mm -hmm. You know, in the space of, of my consciousness, here comes the thought, right? She says, and I love this quote, the worst thing that can happen is a thought. <laughs> I, love, I, lo I love that too. I, know. I love that too. And, yeah. and, and it's absolutely true. Yeah, it's true. It really yeah. is absolutely true. The worst thing that can happen is a thought. We, we've all experienced that. You know, you, you're, you're sitting or in the middle of the night or whenever, you know, a, a fear-based thought comes in. Right. And it's like all of a sudden, 
all hell breaks loose, like, oh my God, and then the future, projecting into the future, and oh, oh my God, oh my God. So specifically, if somebody comes to you with a, uh, a fear mm -hmm. or a self-doubt, right. um, I'd like to even think of something specific, or you can think of something specific. What would be, uh, I mean, the first thing that you do that is always wonderful is that you really listen deeply. Yeah. I mean, and that is so healing. I mean, you're really listening deeply. One of the other things that you do that's wonderful is that you see it for what it is and you'll just start laughing. <laughs> and it's a very genuine laugh. This is not a, a bullshit laugh or, you know, uh, minimizing or anything. It's just you can feel the place that laugh is coming from is simply because you're seeing that whole fear-based thing or that whole doubt thing or that whole thing. You're seeing it as the movie that it is. Exactly. And so by by that, it's sometimes just that. It's like I you know, feel a great relief. Right. But then what might be a step that you would do after that specifically with uh, something that might come up with somebody like a fear or a doubt. How, how might you work with that with somebody? Well, most of the time, uh, somebody comes with a, you know, like, a, as, as they say in the medical model, a presenting symptom. Yes, a <laughs> right? presenting symptom. Yeah. And so whatever that is, we're going to look at that to see what is showing up. And I always share my model, and I ask them, does it make sense to them? Mm -hmm. And whatever doubts they might have about it, so that we can sort of have a, a common way of working with what's going on with them. But at that point, it's like, oftentimes, I, I, I ask them to look in as broadly as they can. For, for instance, I said something a while ago about dealing with the idea of I'm not respected. For them to look as broadly as they can for the least little frequency, the least little bit, the least bit that they can be aware of in which they don't respect themselves. Because the nature of a projection is that the consciousness projects through a lens. It might just be one little dust spot on the lens of disrespect that you have here, right? But when it shows up out there, it, to get your attention, it's going to look like a major incident of some mm. kind. And so you use that. That's why I always say everything in the dream is happening on behalf of your awakening. It wants to get your attention to what's going on here in uh, the distorted lens of the fear-based self-concept. Mm. That distortion is showing up as your world. The only information our reality has, and this is really radical and nobody has to <laughs> accept this, <laughs> but the only information available for what this world presents is in our mind, our fear-based mind of separation. Mm. Consciousness projects through that. Interestingly, you know, in the, in the whole of physics, of the current physics model, it's being proven that this reality is a projection. Uh. <laughs> And that is caught in the dream of, of this being kicked out of the garden, earn your living by the sweat of the brow. Now the left brain takes over. It's going to be cranking out the answers, right? They're all based in a polarity. It's like game on. You know? yeah, yeah. yeah. So what we look for is what is it in them and their self-relationship. And fundamentally, at some point with everybody, we find this initiating first self conclusion like I'm not good enough it, it gets to be very specific for people and because the experience starts pre-verbally in their energetic field of being here and that being scary and being in fear and then it moves through their life as a toddler and they start to have the experience that matches that self-definition and then it gets languaged and it's going to be, I'm always in the way, I'm not good enough, I'm always wrong, I can't do it right, uh, those kinds of conclusions. And then out of that, again, we develop strategies of how to make, you know, 
one uh, child in a family with an alcoholic parent may think that the, the, her strategy will be to be very quiet and not to uh, uh, elicit any attention. Another one might be to make, make happy daddy if he's the alcoholic. It's like show up and make him feel good so that the whole family will be. There are many, many ways uh, that we create, but then we think that we are that. And therein lies the rub, because considering that we are that, uh, it's, it's, you're only going to be so worthy, and the other end of the stick is under there. You know, The self-esteem issue is only at the level of the fear-based self-concept. It does not exist in the truth of who I am. Say that last sentence one more time. Yeah, the only consideration for, for worthiness or self-esteem or being a good person exists at the ego, fear-based self-concept level. Mm -hmm. You see, there are, no, there are no questions in the truth. Mm -hmm. it, it's like the awareness of that, or the sense of presence, the sense of connection to all that is. It's where oneness just falls in. Everybody has this experience sometime or another. And for many people, they have it often in a meditation experience. I work with a lot of people who have been on a bhakti or a guru disciple path, and it's, it opens their heart in this most beautiful way, and they experience the expansion and the truth of who they are. Uh, but because this, this other thing is not addressed, it still plays over here, and it's still projecting and looking like difficulties, and they wonder what is wrong because right. they're full of love and light. Right. 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 Yeah. So there, this this has to be dealt with, and the way it's mm -hmm. dealt with is to see it through it for what it is, which is not true, right. whatever that takes. And like I said, when that's creating a reality, it's very compelling. Yeah. Yeah, and that's yeah. the very. That's the very individual thing that I was talking about in the introduction of the show, of how meaningful it's been for me working with you. Because, okay. yes, I had many years and had these beautiful inner experiences, and there's this other area right. that I feel like just very beautifully, and over these last couple years, has become dismantled. Perfect. And light yeah. being shed on it in a very beautiful personal way that I so appreciate. And um, one other uh, subject I want to uh, bring in before we uh, maybe start bringing it to a close is that uh, the subject of money. <laughs> Yes, there's that beautiful laugh. Yes, yes, because this is something that certainly plagues uh, people. Yeah. You know, I know how it's <laughs> plagued me and is plaguing me less and less. Yeah. You know, I feel more and more just relaxing into a place of allowing life to live me and thereby uh, just you know, it, it's kind of like the uh, the quote of uh, the lilies of the field. You know, exactly. you know, l l look look at how uh, the Creator takes care of the lilies of the field. Would He not take care of you as well? Right. You need to toil and worry and stress out. Right. But I'd like you to elaborate on this because I think what you have to say is very powerful and very wonderful. Well, we're talking about a projection, right? Mm -hmm. And we look out and see a world and caught in a fear-based idea of who we are. We're, the way we interact with that world is in, usually in two different ways. It's the idea that we need to get something from it, money mm -hmm. being predominant in that, or that we need to avoid something. Mm -hmm. the, and, and, and because, and what, I mean, the, uh, <laughs> the reason I laugh is because we, at one point or another, it just, uh, dawns on us that if this is a dream, there's nothing I can get out of it. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's if this is a projection, then where do I find my good? I'm not going to get enough from that movie screen to fulfill anything here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to be able to keep anything from happening in a movie. That's a projection of my distorted self-concept. Mm -hmm. So what's being shown on the screen, and, and that's, again, the collective thing. It's like 
of course the planet is bereft because we've been trying to get out of it what we think we need to be okay. We've never not been okay, but in the lie, in the lie of the fear-based self-concept and the projection of it, and that fear-based self-concept includes death. Mm. Yeah? Mm. The polarity of life and death. Mm. Yeah? Mm. So, so this whole thing about getting, right, is a way that our attention is used that's such an incoherent low frequency that what shows up is difficulty and stress around it, just the things you were describing. When we bring our attention back to the truth of who we are, and, and, and that's, that's not saying trying to make anything look different, it's just becoming aware that when I'm on my own side energetically, not psychologically, when I'm present here on my own side, then the projection even starts to be clear up. And in that, my good arises. When we are caught in the projection, it's like this taut kind of linear, sequential kind of need and demand. And even though life is flowing and arising with our good all the time, we don't experience it. We think that everything I need to have here depends on money out there. And we don't experience our good coming to us. The minute that we're back here on our own side, we experience the fullness of aliveness. And that's a kind of affluence. The, um, you know, it's a kind of flow. It's a kind of blessing. And it can come in many, many ways, including money. Uh, but we, we need to get our attention back here with what's truly of benefit instead of having the idea that there's something out there, if I can just get enough of it, I'll be okay. Mm. This fear-based idea will never be okay with enough of anything. Mm. One of my favorite quotes is, you can't get enough of what you don't need to make you happy. Mm. And there are many, many examples of that in people that we know in ourselves sometimes of piling it higher and deeper, and we're still like, eh, is this all there is, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the fundamental question that has to do with the projected fear-based dream. Yeah. Okay, darling, I, I, <laughs> I, I love you. And come in for a two-shot here. I love you. Mm. I'm so grateful for you in my life, Polly. <laughs> and uh, anyone who's uh, watching this can contact Polly. We'll make contact information available at the bottom of the screen. And uh, this has been wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, and amazing. And amazing. <laughs> Woo! Okay, so. That's it for this episode of Life on Maui. It's been a blast for me. I just love this woman. I love the uh, effect that uh, she's had in my life and continues to have from all my travels all over the world. Uh, it's just been the most wonderful play and playfulness and um, the most wonderful kind of inner expanding and growth and happiness and uh, it, it's just been a pleasure and I look forward to more and more and more of it. She's now going to be doing some traveling around the mainland and visiting different communities of people who, uh, you know, want, want her attention and want her teaching and uh, one of the amazing things, amazing things, amazing things that I see with Polly is the capacity to be um, over the years, even though she's had more and more people who have come to her, I've never, ever felt any lack of just fully being present for me when I'm with her. So, saying all of that, thank you so much for watching this show, and until next time, aloha. Mm -hmm. Crazy, but I'm never